You're listening to Legally Bliss Conversations. This podcast reclaims and rewrites the stories female attorneys have been told about how we should practice law, grow our businesses, treat our clients, treat ourselves, and craft our identities as female attorneys. We'll hear inspiring stories from current and former female attorneys, the ones who question the stories they've been told, the ones who aren't afraid to live boldly and step into their own power. We'll learn from women who define success on their terms. Through lighthearted and curious conversation, we'll impact the challenges these inspiring female attorneys have already navigated. So join me on this journey. You'll be empowered and ready to rewrite a completely new story about what is possible for you. I would like to welcome everyone to Legally Bliss Conversations in a very warm welcome today to Annette Chody. Annette graduated from law school 20 years ago, and she's the founder of LawQuill, a legal digital marketing agency focused on small and solo law firms. Annette wrote the best-selling book, Click Magnet, the ultimate digital marketing guide for law firms, and hosts the podcast, Legal Marketing Lounge. She is a sought after keynote and CLE speaker throughout the United States and Canada. And that used to do theater and professional comedy, which is not so different from the legal field, if we are all being honest. And again, welcome, Annette. I am absolutely thrilled you're here. You're so fun. You're a wealth of information. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to be on and to be visiting with you. I love everything you're doing and the community that you're creating. I am just uh, honored to be part of it. Well, you, you're so kind and I'm honored to have you today to talk about um, not really digital marketing, um, because if you want some good digital marketing stuff, you need to go subscribe to your LinkedIn account. Um, and your newsletter or be in my community where they can find some great um, information from you about digital marketing. But I want to learn about Annette and your journey into to where you are today. So let's go back just a couple of years, just a few years. So let's go back and talk about why did you go, why did you decide to go to law school? Like what what on earth made you think that this was a good idea? Well, I have, I have to actually have to correct that bio because it's been 22 years <laughs> since I graduated from law school. It's, it's been a hot minute. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I went to undergraduate in, uh, you know, I, I got two undergraduate degrees in political science and okay. international relations, cool. but I did theater also throughout all of college. And I went to graduate school for theater and film. And after I got out of graduate school, um, I was doing, I was doing theater. I was doing some professional comedy. I was doing, I was just like, wow, I did is hard to make money doing this. And I was like, I don't particularly want to eat ramen noodles for the rest of my life. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's a time um, period in our life for ramen noodles, right? Right. No, they're all right. Yeah. right? Everyone should go through that phase of where, yeah. You really don't have any money. <laughs> sure. so that really, I think, um, you know, it's just like everyone should do some sort of service industry job, right? So that, you know, it's just something that is a good life lesson. 100%. So I ended up going to law school because frankly, my undergraduate was in political science and international relations. And I was like, I, I think I can do it. So I actually uh, applied to only one law school, which is UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City, right? near where I was. And I got in, uh, gratefully. And, um, I just, I really loved my experience there. Cool. I'm a very competitive person. Yeah. And so law school was an environment where people are competitive, right? That is sort of the right. upper echelon of competition. And so that is, that is how I, I got into law school and I loved it. And I was actually sort of being uh, prepped to be a trial attorney. So I was on moot court. I was on appellate court, you know, I was doing all of the things. Um, and then life circumstances made me actually take a pause within my law school mm -hmm. uh, academic career for just a year. And um, I ended up when I came back, all of my friends, cause you know, it's only three years, all of them had graduated. And so sad about that. But 
what was interesting was I was hearing back from them the horror stories six months in. And now you have to understand this was in 2000. Mm, yeah. So it was a long time ago. And they were saying, you know, all of the draws of big law, the money, all of it, six months in, the shine on that had started to wear off. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the trial attorneys started to get very disillusioned with the cases that they were forced to take that did not align with their ethics, but they had to take it, right? They had to do the case. So armed with that bit of knowledge, I decided to go in a bit of a different direction and not do trial work after I graduated from law school. But that's sort of a very long answer to your story about my sort of journey in law school. Well, yeah, I mean, it, that's okay because it it kind of is a long story, right? Like looking back, it doesn't seem as bad, but like in the moment, um, it probably seemed very daunting and probably very scary too that like you'd had this, you know, kind of break for a year, everyone else has gone on and I don't know the circumstances of that break, but you know, at least you kind of took, you kind of learn from it, right? You were able to glean information from people who were six months to a year ahead of you at that point. And so that, that was good, right? Cause you're like, oh, okay, maybe this whole big law thing isn't really what it's all cracked up to be for, for many people, maybe even for me. It was a huge blessing in disguise, which is frankly, I'll be honest with you, the way that God has worked throughout my entire life yeah. is uh, putting things in my path that I was deeply frustrated with that ended up being a huge blessing for me. And the circumstances were, frankly, it was money and I needed to stop for a year and just work Mm -hmm. in order to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I made the decision to do. And everyone told me not to do it. Mm. Absolutely. There was not one person, but I said, I know what is best for me. um, And I need to not, I I need to be able to financially get through this, you know, I need to be able to breathe slightly at the end of this. And so at the end of the day, it was a, a, a beautiful blessing for me because I made life choices after that, that I would never have made 12 months prior to that. Wow. So that right there is a good lesson in kind of listening to your inner tuition about, um, Inner, inner tuition. <laughs> tuition was the problem. <laughs> it was the tuition that was the problem. That okay, was the problem. What is inner tuition? I have no idea. Okay. Inner intuition. I knew what you meant. But then I was like, I was like, wait, isn't intuition inner? So then I was thinking in my head, <laughs> that's sort of redundant. I mean, you know what I mean? So what it was inner to, okay. So that made no sense, but tuition was the problem, but you lent, you listened to your intuition and you didn't, you didn't really kind of fall for that social pressure of what like everyone else is saying because it was, yeah. And it really wasn't intuition as much as it was just my checkbook. It was like, like, I didn't have to think very hard. I was like, wow, this is not on the right side of the column. (laughs) So, so it was, it was, um, it was an, an, at the time it was, I felt very deflated. Mm. I felt discouraged you know, at the time I'm older now, so I don't care, but at the time I was embarrassed. Right. I I didn't tell a lot of people what was going on. Um, but now I look back and it was really the very best thing for me. Um, because like I said, I would never have had that insight from other people who had left. And I will tell you that the draw of big law, the draw of, um, trial work. I mean, I was, I mean, whatever fear of public speaking exists, I don't have that bone in my body. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, because I did theater and so trial work was not a big, not going to be a big deal for me. It was going to be actually kind of my jam, Sure. but I ended up going in a different direction just, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. And a lot of them had to do with that one year gap. Okay. So let's talk about this different direction that you um, that you decided to take? Well, if you remember earlier in the story, I said, you know, my first choice was not law school. My first choice was 
Broadway. And so far, Broadway has not called. They've not so, called you? I know. Hugh Jackman yeah. right now is in The Music Man. I don't know why I am not playing opposite him. I'm very confused why the I Tony know. Awards have not called me. Why has Taylor Swift not called me to be a backup singer? I don't, I don't know. know what's happening here. I don't know. When I talk Sorry. to her, though, I will ask her. Please do. That Thank question. you. <laughs> so, right. And so I just, I felt like I got really sucked into law school and that can be really you can really start to get blinders in law school yeah. regarding what your career path is, what you want to do with your life. And if you're competitive, which you probably are, if you're going to law school, you want to win. So you don't even care anymore what you're winning. You just want to win it, right? Like, right. I don't even care what the prize is anymore. I just need to win. And so taking that break and stepping back, I realized I really don't want to work a thousand hours a week yeah. for people that don't care about me, that I'm working cases that would not be, you know, that would give me moral heartburn. So I just really sat and thought, what do I want my life to look like? Mm -hmm. And I decided, you know what, I want to be happy more than I want to make money. I want to enjoy the life I have. I want to be able to go to auditions if I want to, you know, do regional theater. I want to spend time with my family. That is just more important to me. And it turns out as luck would have it, or as, you know, it's not luck. It was totally, I would never have planned this. The job that I worked during that interim, I thought I cared nothing about. And it was with an accounting firm, actually in their legal department, doing legal compliance for ERISA and HIPAA law. Mm. And it just so happens that the Department of Labor uh, Employee Benefit Security Administration, which enforces those laws, um, had an option for an interview. And just as a side note, I'm going to say this for those who are listening, who might not be lawyers, but might be even law students. I went to the career center at the time in my law school and we didn't have the, you know, there was nothing on the interweb. Okay. So I had to go in and look at the three ring binder. Okay. Of like available jobs. So the people that are of my generation will know exactly what I'm talking about. Or the posted on the board kind of thing. Right, the, exactly. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I was looking through it and, you know, she, there was this career counselor person there and I saw the shout and I'm like, oh, I have experience in this. Well, I'm going to be honest, Susie, I was not in top 10. Okay. I was not. And I said, I, I think I'm going to go for this. And she discouraged <laughs> me. She said, mm, I don't think, mm, no. Nah. Mm -mm. I don't think you should go for that because uh, they're really looking for someone a little different than you. <laughs> okay. It sounds very similar to my career services experience because side note, not top 10. Right. Who is? So then I said, <laughs> I, so then I just got, people? <laughs> right. I don't know who they are. I don't know anybody who was top 10, but um, I, it made me fussy. So I went on the interview. Long story short is I got the job and I worked there almost two decades. You're like I'm getting that job. As soon as, yeah. So after I graduated, they offered me the opportunity to stay and work with them. And the truth is, is it was a government job. So it's not as great of pay, right? But the hours are solid, straight hours. The work was good. I got to travel, but I also got to not travel too much. I was always with my family. They were very accommodating. And it was exactly what I wanted. Not necessarily, it wasn't my dream life, but it was something that if I had to do something for eight hours a day, it was fine. And mm -hmm. also I felt like it worked well with what my life plan was. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a really long time. Um, and I was very grateful uh, for that opportunity. Um, you know, things changed sort of midstream about halfway in. And I started to get really frustrated. I had the same experience that I feel like a lot of women have, and I hate to pull that card, but it was really true. I was training people that then became supervisors and I was consistently passed over. Um, but I was a single mom at the time, um, you know, after I'd gotten divorced and there really wasn't an option of thinking what else can I do? When I got remarried though, was when my husband could see just really how miserable I was in this sort of beige cubicle world and that it was not really great for someone who's a very competitive person. I'd sort of gotten all of that, 
beaten out of me. Yeah. Um, and I had become very complacent because there was no reward for working hard there. Yeah. I think as human beings, we crave uh, competition, we crave success, we crave bettering ourselves. And when that's not ever met with any kind of sense of accomplishment, you do become, you know, I became deflated there then. Mm -hmm. And so then that starts the next chapter, right? <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> so you knew there was something more, right? You're like, you, you were kind of getting complacent in the career. Maybe. Yeah, after, you know, two decades. Well, so it took, it took a while. <laughs> you're getting maybe kind of bored. You're not being stimulated the way that you might have been at the very beginning of your career. And I mean, honestly, like 20 years is a good, that's a pretty darn good commitment, at, at, you know, I think at this point. so. So your, your husband is like, I feel like he kind of lit a fire under you a little bit. So let's talk about that. Well, Susie, I'm not sure if he lit a fire, or if he was just tired of me complaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he lit the fire, right? He was it like, please, can you stop talking about how much you hate your job? And so he's like, you know, what else could you do? I knew at that point, I really was not at the point where I could start a law firm, right? Um, at that point, I was in my 40s. I really didn't, you know, but what happened was this, again, it was just these little bits of light on a footstep path. I didn't see the whole path. So this is going to sound like a non sequitur, but it isn't. My husband and I got a Sprinter van and we decided to convert it you know, like they do, oh, like the kids yeah. do, right? Uh, it took us a lot longer than one month that you see on the YouTube. But that said, <laughs> I got really here. excited about it yeah. and I started blogging about it. Yeah. And I learned a lot of stuff about SEO and I started getting really interested in it. And then my friend said to me, who was an attorney, you know, you can write blogs for law firms. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I had no idea what she was even saying. Yeah. So that was the that was the tipping point. Okay. So now here's a whole nother area um, as, as a career that I didn't even know existed before this. So I got so excited because it was, it sort of combined everything that I ever wanted, Susie. It was creative. It yeah. was, it was legal. It was academic in nature. It was competitive. It was everything. And I loved it. So I started working as a free, the way that my career in this started was I started working as a freelancer for very, very large digital marketing agencies in the legal industry. Okay. So I worked for more than one as a freelancer and I really learned a lot from them. But then the problem was that once I learned so much, I realized that I had pulled the curtain back on the Wizard of Oz Ooh. and I was beginning to see parts of the industry that were very unsettling to me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, lawyers don't know SEO. They don't know digital marketing. And so when they hire one of these really large digital marketing agencies, um, they are oftentimes held hostage in a year long contract and they don't know what they don't know. Right. Cause they're in the business of practicing law. Right. Right. And these companies would completely take advantage of them. And I'm not talking only about SEO, not performing the way that they said they were, they were providing legally inaccurate articles and also articles that violated ethics rules, right? You know, eth you know, ethics violations were inside of these articles. So then that is giving me moral heartburn, right? I'm like, I can't do this anymore. So now here's my husband again, hearing me complain after several years of this. And finally he says, you know, I just said, I, you know, I should just start my own agency. And he's like, yeah, do it. So at this point, I was actually working two jobs. I was working my department of labor job. And then full time, I was working as a freelancer just because I loved it. I was going to ask if both of those were coinciding because. Yes, because I just, I just work. Like I love, I'm very, I just, I just love to work. Yeah. I just love. It's okay to like know, to work. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, that was when I created Lockwell because I felt like that I, I was going to be, I was going to be different. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody says that, but the way that I was different was not only that I was founded by an attorney, right. And that I was going to run the whole show, but also that I can explain 
to, I can demystify yeah. the whole digital marketing process for attorneys. And with that foundation, right now I have over 150 articles. It should be 200 by mid-year next year um, on, my, on my website for free. I've yeah. got a podcast for free. I have, you know, a book. And the reason I wrote the book was because I read all the other books that were out there. I'm sure you know which ones I'm talking about. And I was frustrated because all of them were sort of just a shill for whatever company was writing that or whatever, you know, digital marketer was writing it. I'm like, yeah, but this isn't helping law firms understand or frankly hold their own digital marketing agency accountable. Mm -hmm. So that was why I started my own digital marketing agency was just really with that in mind. And again, it feeds everything I wanted to do, right? I'm getting to work in the legal industry. I'm getting to talk law with people, but I'm also getting to be competitive, yeah. right? Getting to number one on Google for these law firms. And when they win, I win, right? So it's just, it's just fun. It's, I wake, I wake up every day and I cannot believe that this is my life, that I get to do this. It is I was born to do this well and be on Broadway with Hugh Jackman, but this too. <laughs> I think that's really cool. Um, I was born to do this. Um, and you know, you had said at one point, I'd ask you, what do you, you would, what would you like the listener to know uh, kind of about you and your, you know, just a little piece of advice. And you'd said that it's possible to completely transition out of law into something different later in life. But what's interesting is you haven't transitioned completely out of law, right? Like you taken all of these things that you've learned in your life and created something that integrates all of them. Even like your feet, like you love, like, like you said earlier, like you're not afraid to do the public speaking, right? You have no problem doing presentations, getting out of there, talking to people beyond being right. on stage. And this you know, your career gives you that opportunity to the extent that you want it. Yeah. I mean, I love doing CLEs, going to different bar associations and doing CLEs or uh, speaking at conferences. My goal is part of my part, you know, I say that I'm, you know, an attorney and I'm a digital marketer and all of that. I also say I'm a comedian because there is something about making digital marketing more approachable for law firms because it is a bit of an overwhelming and, and daunting, you know, area of a business that people feel a little, I think, frustrated by and intimidated by. Sure. And so you're right. It really does juxtapose and intersect every little bit of what I feel were um, the gifts that I I was given, which are clearly different than what other people are given. Um, but I just, it's, I just can't, like I said, I just, I can't even believe that this is my life that I get to do this every day. Okay. So I think this is a good time for me to ask you what, what does success look like to you? I, it sounds like you're kind of living that vision of your definition of success, but I would love to hear kind of you put that in, into your words. So for me, I think it ends up being, you know, what do you value the most? And, you know, that sometimes sounds a little woo woo, but it really isn't because if you know what you hold to be the most important things in your life, then it's easier yeah. to say no to a six figure big law job. It's easier to say no to different opportunities that might come your way. Um, if you have a certain value set, uh, you know, there's certain types of law that, you know, maybe we won't write for and that it's easier to say no to those things, not out of judgment or anything like that, but just because I know me, I just know me and I know what my values are. And so for me, success is just being able to wake up and know that I have no moral heartburn <laughs> and that I am doing, I'm using the gifts that I think God gave me in a way that helps others. So that's my value. But I think that when people can find whatever that value is, homeschooling your children, that might be a new value that a lot of people didn't have before COVID, 
right? They never even thought about it before, yeah. before the pandemic. Maybe your value is to make a lot of money really fast so that you can retire early. So you live really frugally for 10 years and just save it. So whatever your value is, you, you will not be happy unless you know what those values are. And then you align your life to those. That's what I believe. So as far as I'm concerned right now, I, I am successful just from a personal point of view. Now, I think I may have mentioned that I was competitive. So I'm not sure that there is ever an end, right? Because there's always one more law firm I can help. There's one more article I can write. There's one more pod. There's just more things to do because I enjoy it. But I would, I have to just genuinely say, truthfully, I feel successful now. I'm able to spend time with my daughter, with my husband. Um, my, my daughter goes to an online accredited Christian school. So we hang out and sing musical songs during the day, right? Like that is success to me, right? So I think that that is a different thing for every person, mm -hmm. but it's a great feeling when it finally comes together. And I will say this also, Susie, that it is never too late to figure out what, what your values are and what success means to you. I changed complete careers <laughs> completely yeah, yeah. in the, in my forties. I could have done it in my fifties. You can do it anytime. So yes. never feel like it is that you are tethered or beholden to something that is not serving your your true, your true values and honoring that. Let's take a quick pause for a message from my sponsor, Prominent Practice. Are you thinking about a career transition from big law or partnership to a solo practice, selling your practice, or maybe you're launching a project unrelated to law? Whatever the reason for your transition, you'll need support along the way. Enter Prominent Practice, an executive consulting and marketing firm specializing in branding, positioning, and reputation management for transitioning attorneys. Founded by a female entrepreneur who spent a decade building smart digital platforms for thought leaders before pivoting to focus on high-end service providers who were preparing for successions, mergers, and acquisition events in their businesses. If you're thinking about making a big business move, don't risk losing the ability to leverage the reputation you've spent your career building. Let Prominent Practice be your guide. Visit prominentpractice.com slash bliss for an exclusive introduction. Figuring out what your values are is so important at any age and keeping in yes. mind that they can and will evolve. Yes. You know, your values as, you know, a 23 year old may be very different <laughs> as a 20, as a 33 year old mom right? sure. wants to homeschool her children. And so I think checking in with that periodically, especially like if there's been life changes is so important. And I, I, I am an example of someone who didn't really dig into my life values as a younger person. And I kind of ended up hit, bumping into walls you know, in reaching certain quote unquote successes that were more externally defined, right. And getting there and still feeling something kind of missing, like this lack of, like a, a, just a, a lack of fulfillment in some way. And I think that part of that was that I didn't sit down and take the time to really figure out, um, what my value was, values were, you know, because, because I was making decisions to get me to those external definitions of success that society has told us means success. You know, the corner office and making six figures before you're 28 and driving whatever kind of car and right. having a trophy husband or wife, you know, like that kind of thing. So um, this is this is really important, I think, to talk about to really drive home the importance of taking a few minutes, like even after this conversation, um, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and just really, really thinking about, you know, what are my values and how can I make decisions on a daily basis that, that are aligned with those values? I completely 
agree with that. And I will say that it, it's not just something that, you know, maybe you should think about once for 10 minutes, right? When you're in the shower, when you're driving in the car, <laughs> when you are really, th- if you are not happy, whatever that means to you, right? If you are not happy, then nothing else feels right in your life. Mm -hmm. But when you are happy, when you feel successful, everything aligns itself. And I'll just, I'll just say kind of a funny story along with that. Uh, So, you know, I said, I was not top 10. If I had chased what I thought society wanted me to chase, I will tell you that, that for 20 years, um, you know, I was not recognized by my law school at all, because why would I be, you know, I was just kind of doing you know, some work at the department of labor, right? There's nothing really astronomically phenomenal about that. So I was actually, uh, one of my law professors for my one L year is now the Dean of the law school at UMKC. And she is amazing. And she was a great professor and she's a great Dean. And I was at uh, the Missouri bar conference. I was speaking there, but I also had a booth and she came by and told me that she was proud of me. And that took 22 years to get. And I didn't even know that that was something that was important to me until it happened. Mm. And I thought, who would have ever thought that me, right, out of everyone, but it got even better. She actually, because she has so much forward thinking for a law school, she actually not only has a class in her law school, she teaches it still as the dean about how to start your own law practice. And it talks about the accounting and the business and how to get clients. It's just a brilliant class. Yeah. She asked me to come be a guest speaker at the class and she's using my book as part of the curriculum now. Wow. Now shut up, Susie. Are you even kidding me with this? So because I am doing something that I feel good about, that brings me joy, that I feel successful, other things like that are presenting themselves because I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm not trying to put a square peg in a round hole, right? Yeah. So if you are, you know, if, if someone listening to this does not feel the way that I feel or you feel, they can They can feel this way. Um, And it won't be overnight, right? Like these decisions, even once you make a decision, it's hard. The transition is awkward, cumbersome, emotionally, financially sometimes. And take time, lots of time. It does take time. But man, the, the, the end of it, and I mean, I'm not saying like I'm at the end, but just the fact that I wake up every day so grateful and thankful and, and just thrilled that this is my life. I would wish that for every single person listening to this. I love that. So let me, let me ask you, do you have time for another question or two? Of course. Of course. course. I'm curious, (laughs) where do you get your inspiration or who inspires you? That's a great question. So First of all, as you can probably tell in this conversation, I am Christian. And so a lot of my uh, values and the way that I run my business and hopefully my life align with that. So I'm always trying to do the right thing, the ethical thing, all of those things. So, you know, obviously the Bible (laughs) is a pretty good inspiration for me. But if you're talking about a rubber hits the road, who is someone that inspires you? I can tell you who it is. It's Pat Flynn. So Pat, Pat Flynn, Pat. <laughs> yes. So Pat Flynn has nothing to do with the legal industry at all. He is a podcaster who has several different courses. Actually, I took his course to learn how to do podcasting, his power up podcasting course. I did the power up podcasting. Right? Pop, right? I'm like, pop, I can't believe that you did that. Well, it's- How did we not like cross paths then? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. But it is, um, I love his heart. He does. Have he has heart. a very servant heart. He does. So when I say that, this, this guy is a multimillionaire, if not billionaire, many times over. Yeah. And you would never know it 
to look at him or talk to him. He has open office hours every week. He yes. answered one of my questions one time. He is always there for his community. And he's even written a book about how to get these super fans. Super fans. It's his title, right? Super fan? Super fan. Yeah. 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 And the reason is because his entire business model is give away more than you ever sell. And when you do that, people will remember you and it's, it's not shady, right? You have to do it from, you have to do it honestly, and you have to do it. You have to do it authentically. You can't do it like, well, I'm going to put out 10 blog articles that are very, very useful. And I'm sure I'm going to get some clients from it. You can't do it like that. It really has to be sort of, you know, a tithing into the community, not expecting any return back. Mm -hmm. And just to be seen as the person that people go to for help, because when, when I have a question about anything, I know that it just seems like he's your friend, right? And he's got a massive team. And I thought to myself, if I ever start a business, I want to be just like Pat. I want to be someone who is approachable, who does seem like an expert, who clearly knows the information that she's talking about, but that is approachable, accessible, is not arrogant, is humble, always feels like there's something to to learn, works in partnership with other people instead of, in a, I mean, I'm competitive, but really I would rather reach out to the people in my industry and, and have the water rise together, exactly. right? How can we collaborate um, and work together and help Collaborative. And I just yeah. loved everything about him. And so I, I really model or try, have tried to model my business after him by providing a ton of free resources, free stuff on LinkedIn several times a day. Uh, I now have an Instagram account where I'm putting even more things on Instagram and a podcast. I really try to give, I mean, I give away a lot for free (laughs) and I do that because my heart really is to help small and medium-sized law firms beat the large law firms. (laughs) I love it. That's sort of like, it's sort of your, your mission. And one of my, my next questions was like, what do you want to see evolve or change in the legal world or the practice of law? So as you know, Susie, the practice of law moves exponentially slow. It is just really (laughs) at the speed of snail. And so I've had discussions with lawyers before who are really not even that old. And they're like, no, I get everything from referrals. And I want to say to them, and sometimes do, you know, those referrals are still going to your website. You know, if they're under the age of really 70, right, 60, 70, they, and even at that age, they are still probably going and looking at your website before they just blindly trust a referral source. So, so I really feel like if I could get the legal industry to understand that their law firm is not just one of 47,000 law firms in the United States. And that's an accurate number. Uh, It is also a business. So that means you need to have a brand, right? That is memorable. You please, tough love. If you have a gavel or if you have like the scales of justice. (laughs) Yeah. Like, unless you have those in like some creative crazy way. Right. But if you have like Navy blue and a gavel, like that is just, or there's like skyline, your, your city skyline on your website. Right. Like Uh there's 46,500 other lawyers that have that. So you really want to be memorable. And if I could just convince law firms that a branding is not woo woo, it is an emotional connection that people have with a tangible good or service. Mm -hmm. And that is what people remember. Mm -hmm. We all do it, right? Like we all remember certain brands and I'm not talking about just Nike, right? I'm talking about an accountant. I'm talking about a court reporting agency Um, outside of the legal industry. You know, you're just talking about, I don't know, some sort of interior design furniture that you like. We all have brands that we love. And so 
if you can create a brand that you love, right? Cause it always has to be back. You have to be, you have to have a brand you love. Um, then you can promote it easier. And then you will really start to be a business instead of just a law firm. Mm -hmm. And, and that is what I wish I would see in the legal industry. Cause the people that are doing that right now are, are, it's, it's just, it's easy. It's low hanging fruit because other law firms are just too stubborn (laughs) to do it. Right. They're slow to progress and they're slow to take that up. Yes. Yes. You know, even like, I think about sort of the evolution of my firm and kind of how I've done my branding. Um, I have erred on the side of being very conservative with my brain. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yes. And it's, it's been almost kind of like out of fear of doing anything too, too out there. Like, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, it's just been very, like, it might be just a little more distinguished from other law firms, but it's still not, it, it wouldn't really like generate conversation. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Well, let me give you a conversation. I don't know, but (laughs) (laughs) well, they say any publicity, right? But let me, let me give, let me try, let me change your mind. So, so here's the thing I usually (laughs) say is when you put in chocolate chip cookie recipe in Google, right? There's, there's what, I don't know, 5 billion chocolate chip cookies recipes out there, right? If you put in personal injury law firm, there's a billion out there, right? But if you put in gluten-free, vegan, chocolate chip cookie recipe without nuts. Okay. Now there's not going to be as many people looking for that. That is a hundred percent true right, right. as just chocolate chip cookie. But you know what? The people that are looking for that are going to find you mm-hmm. and you want to find your people. So this works not just with SEO and keywording, right? It works with branding as well. Think about the people that you love to work with. And now think about the people you hate to work with. And we, you know who they are, <laughs> right? Repel those people. <laughs> yes. You want to repel those people. Right? Yeah. 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 So, you know, at the end of the day, that branding, it's not woo woo. It's really clarifying, not only a message, it's clarifying exactly who you are and exactly who you want to find you. And Pat Flynn will say this too, right? That the riches are in the niches, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you are, you know, there's someone that I know that all she does is traffic tickets in New York city. It's all she does. So she's not interested in anything else. That is her niche, uh, which is not actually a hard niche in New York city. But if you can imagine if you did something like that in a smaller city, what kind of return you would get on that? Because now you're not going to get all, you're not going to get DUI. You're not going to get personal injury, but anybody that's looking up travel, if you do it right, Mm -hmm. that's going to be, maybe that's what you love to do. That's your jam, right? So whatever is your jam, I promise if that is what you feel you were created to do, lean into it hard and you will find joy. Okay, those are beautiful words of wisdom that I, I wanna leave off, leave us with. Um, before I um, let you go, go completely, I wanna know what is next for Annette. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a small business owner too. Right. Which is why I feel like I resonate and I connect with a lot of the small and medium law firms that I work with my, their struggles are also my struggles, Mm -hmm. right. As I grow the growing pains always of a business. Sure. So right now I'm growing and, uh, trying to just expand my own brand and try to reach more and more law firms. Uh, the short-term goal, I have my book and it is an ebook. The short goal is going to be making it a, (laughs) thank you, um, is, is going to be making it, uh, an audio book, uh, right at the beginning of the next year. So that's kind of a shorter term goal. Um, continuing on with my podcast, creating more content, uh, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and just really continuing to grow, my law firm to help 
I know that sounds cheesy, right? But it is really true because the more, the more law firms that I help that win, like then I win. Right. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 I just am so competitive. So that is really what my goal is, is just to continue to grow. I think that sounds like a noble goal and doing it with, with uh, a mind of service, right? Like Pat Flynn, um, I think he has a shirt that says, um, maybe like serve always or service first. Like he always, yes. always see him wearing those shirts and I, it's always a good reminder. I think to me as a viewer, of it, like not only like the content being good, mm-hmm. but just yeah. seeing that as, as being a really great, um, it's just a reminder. So, and I have a feeling that you're, you will be doing that. So Annette, where can people find you? Uh, so Instagram is just law.quill. So you, law. So you can, okay. yeah, law.quill. So you can find me there and I have a little bit more, uh, fun stuff there. Um, I do still, you know, my link in bio there has a lot of links to my articles and things like that. But, um, I have a little bit, a little bit more fun on Instagram. Although my stuff on LinkedIn is oftentimes pretty tongue in cheek as well, just cause that's who I am. And I decided if I was going to have a brand, I had to put me in it. And so I think that's really important as well to be to, to make your law firm or to make your business really an extension of you and not to try to be somebody that you're not. Right. You got to spice up that LinkedIn, right? (laughs) Yeah, you do. You do. But LinkedIn is my happy place. I really love it there. Um, just the connections that I've made there and the community. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. That is how we connected. And there's, it's just a really, um, it's just a wonderful professional space that is, uh, growing. And I just, I absolutely love it. It's my happy place. Your happy place. Awesome. Well, you have made me very happy getting to hang out with you today. This has been such a fun conversation, Annette. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and so many words of wisdom. Um, It's been, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It really is an honor to be here. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Really. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today on Legally Bliss Conversations. If you love this episode and you want to hang out with other inspiring and light gold female attorneys, be sure to join the Legally Bliss community at legallyblissed.com. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at Susie Nixon. See you next time.